Whatever happened to Athanasios? The witch told me he died. No one ever believes me, but she told me he died following a song sung by a divine creature. He thought it was a muse, beckoning him to tread the epic cycle. He always knew he was destined for greatness, and how could he not trust a muse who sang just like his mother? The witch never told me what the songs just looked like. Some say she had wings, others say she had a tail. All the witch knew was that she danced on the surface of the ocean, beckoning him over. He was so enchanted by her voice, he never saw the blood darkening the water beneath her. Three days passed until the witch saw him on the shore, half buried in sand. He was but a head, pulled from his body, his sockets were bare and bloody. The witch could tell he was still smiling when the songstress held his head below the surface. He watched her tear his limbs from his body, and one by one, he watched them float away. The only mercy she gave him was to gouge out his eyes so he didn't see the hungry talons shooting towards his throat. Aside from his head, the only thing the songstress didn't devour was his voice box. The witch told me she collects them and stores them in shells she nestles between the rocks. They say that if you ever walk along the shore at night and hear a lonesome scream that travels with the wind, you should turn and follow the direction the wind is travelling and leave the soul to rot alone. If you try to follow, the songstress will find you. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to my Dark History Month. I'm afraid we are actually in my Dark History bedroom because uh, the living room's windows are being fixed. Fantastic. So it's a little bit less aesthetic at the beginning of the season, but I'm sure in a couple of weeks' time it will be back to its normal self. So throughout the season of autumn and winter, my videos will be honouring the dark and monstrous side of ancient history and mythology. Today we'll be exploring the dark origins of the first of two connected yet distinct mythological creatures, the Sirens, followed by the Mermaids, as per the request of Master Man God and Kali. But, but this video is a two-parter, and we're starting with the Sirens first. What's interesting with Mermaids and Sirens is that these songstresses of the sea have two very different perceptions. One is regarded as demonic and monstrous, while the other is beautiful and mystical. But where do these creatures come from? And how has one retained the interest of mass popular culture and the other has been shunned to the depths of classical literature? My name is Chinsia, and together we shall go into the depths of the sea to uncover these ancient stories. So it only seems right that before we explore the dark tales of the mermaid in another video, we start with her less culturally popular demonic counterpart, the siren. Early sources describe the siren as a female in form of head and navel, but a bird from the waist down. Later sources say that the sirens were fish from the waist down, like a mermaid, hence why there is a little bit of an overlap here. However, most sirens actually had wings as well at the same time. And in some cases, sirens are described as having both bird's feet and a fish's tail. Yet, the anatomical construction of this uh, baffles my limited and weak imagination. Regardless of their physical structure, the sirens were consistent in their manner of being. They were creatures who lured sailors to their deaths via their charming singing, either by causing them to fall asleep whilst they were sailing their ships, or by luring them towards dangerous rocks. When vulnerable, the sailors were then attacked by the sirens, who tore at their flesh and drowned them. The earliest writing that we have that mentions the sirens is Homer's Odyssey, where Odysseus, wanting to have his cake and eat it too, asks his sailors to tie him to the mast of his ship so that he can experience their charming song in a safe environment whilst his crew sail past the sirens with their ears plugged with wax. The overture begins with the sirens addressing Odysseus by name, praising him and urging him to stop and hear their voice. The sirens suggest two reasons why Odysseus should stop. You see, the sirens claim the effects of their voice are pleasure and increased knowledge without impeded passage, and the singers proclaim that they themselves know everything that happened on earth, 
including the tale of the Trojan War. Interestingly enough, however, Homer never describes what the sirens look like. The earliest description of their physicality actually comes from Apollodorus of Rhodes in his Argo Nautica in the 3rd century BCE, in which he describes them as being part woman and part seabird. And by the 7th century, sirens were commonly depicted as a human-headed bird. Many scholars believe that the depiction of the sirens in the 7th century were actually inspired by the bar bird of ancient Egypt. You see, the Egyptians believed that individuals were made up of five parts. The bar, the car, the name, the shadow, and the physical body. Now, when it comes to translation, there's no real equivalent of bar in English, but it's quite similar to the idea of personality, whilst also referring to power, and this was also extended to the gods. The interesting thing about Ba is that it only manifested after a person was dead, and it had the power to travel about freely. And the Ba was often shown as a bird whose duty it was to feed the deceased. But anyway, we've gone a bit off track. The myth of the siren and how they looked metamorphosed from that point onwards. Ovid describes them as birds with golden plumage and the face of a virgin. Whatever that means. Clearly, it didn't look like me, however. The significance of the appearance of the sirens is still debated among scholars today, and most scholars fall into two camps of thought, although one has been rather debunked. Now, I'm going to butcher these surnames, so I'm going to say them how I think they're pronounced, but I couldn't find the pronunciation. So, some scholars take the Weika position? Weika? It sounds like I'm saying a naughty word. Anyway, this guy's position, who proposed that the sirens were soul birds, whilst others agree with the busture, busture, we're going with busture, the busture position, which argued that sirens were otherworld enchantresses. Busture argued that the original sirens were not those from Homer, i.e. the ones which were only partially identifiable with Hokiris's daughters and the monsters of the Greek sea saga. Instead, he argued that they were infernal counterparts to the heavenly muses, who charmed the souls of the dead in Hades with their song, and acted as their escort to the underworld. But Buscher's argument has largely been debunked, i.e. comparing the sirens with the muses. Whilst it's true that the sirens and the muses are primarily regarded as songstresses, this feature is superficial compared to the other details that make up their characters. For starters, their genealogies are entirely distinct in Homer, with the Muses being divine inspirers of poetry from Pieria, and the Sirens being destructive creatures dwelling on an unnamed island between the Aeaea and Scylla's cave. According to Hesiod's Theogony, the Muses were daughters of Zeus by Mnemosyne, whilst the Sirens were born of Phorsus, or Achilles and Chithon, or they were the daughters of the river god Achilles and the Muse Terpsichore, or perhaps the Kilos and Styrope. I know it's complicated. Myths vary, okay, but two of these traditions are actually found in Pseudo Apollodorus. It wasn't until the Hellenistic period that the Muses and the Sirens became rivals in an aetiological myth in which the Muse was said to have been their mother, to make things more complicated. So, where did the theory that the Sirens were connected to the underworld come from? Well, it actually stems from association. You see, according to Homer, the sirens resided in a flowery meadow, and flowery meadows, or rather Ashfordel meadows in Greek mythology, were associated with the underworld. Homer himself describes the realm of the dead as an Ashfordel meadow, and the queen of the underworld herself, Persephone, was abducted whilst picking flowers in a meadow. All right, I know what you're saying. She was technically actually picking um, Narcissus flowers. But Narcissus flowers are commonly known as daffodils, and the word daffodil is derived from the word asphodel. Additionally, to add credence to the association, Pausanias said that on Rhodes, statues of Corre Persephone and Artemis Hecate were crowned with asphodel. Don't you love the tangents that we go on together? 
Anyway, back on track. There are even more examples of the sirens being associated with the muses. In the 10th book of the Republic, Plato claims that sirens preside over the eight mythical concentric spheres of heaven. The eschatological myth of Ur tells the story of how Ur, who died in battle, comes back to life 12 days later and reports on what he saw and heard in the afterlife. The story concerns the judgement of souls, rewards and punishments, the structures of the universe and more specifically the mechanism of celestial movements before the choice between different kinds of afterlife. So are you ready for this because this is where it gets deep. Ur explains that when souls have passed seven days in a meadow at the crossroads of heaven and hell, they leave for a journey of four days. On the fifth day, they come to a light, a column or a rainbow, which binds heaven and earth, like ropes that surround a boat. This thread-like light suspends a spindle of necessity, also known as a nanki, which causes the rotation of spheres. This sphere is tall consists of a hook, a shaft and a whirl, which is a weight that makes it spin. The hook is affixed to the top of the shaft and the whirl is at the other end. The hook is used to spin the shaft, which in turn spins the whirl. Placed within the whirl of the celestial spindle are eight orbits, each of which creates a perfect circle. The outer circle is the cosmos and it turns upon the knee of necessity, Ananki, as she spins the thread. The interior circles turn more slowly and in opposite directions. The seven inner circles are the five planets, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, Venus, and the sun and the moon. Atop each circle, a siren sings a single note, and the ensemble is in harmony. There are eight sirens to correspond with the cosmos and the seven planets, and their octave is a harmonious music of the spheres. Now, when reading this, Plutarch was pretty confused. I mean, I can't picture it myself, but other people can. Anyway, why was Plutarch confused? Well, Plutarch was confused because Plato was suggesting that these terrifying monsters, the Sirens, were celestial rather than infernal and chthonic. And thus, Plutarch assumed that Plato was just a bit stupid and confused the Sirens with the Muses. However, that doesn't make sense because A, Plato isn't stupid, and B, there were nine muses, not eight. So, you see, Plato's sirens aren't the sirens from Homer, they're actually the product of philosophical thought, whilst Homer's sirens are mythological in nature. But it is the latter that nourishes the former. And because our focus today is on the mythological rather than the philosophical conceptualization of the sirens, we're going to just steer very gently past this immense discussion, because trust me, I couldn't really get my head around it, and steer back to mythology. See, whilst the link between the muses and the sirens as songstresses is slightly tenuous at best, the link between the sirens and the mermaids is much harder to remove. And that's a tale we're going to be telling for another time. So this is just part one. Part two is much longer, uh, so I decided to split Sirens into their own little video. And it has been a stressful month thanks to tenement issues, which means all my windows are being, you know, redone, and they're not going to be done for another week. But as you can tell, October is monstrous month. And thanks to everyone who has been commenting over on my community page, I've taken all of your requests into account. So there will be multiple videos. I hope if my video editing skills are up to par, but I've already scripted several. So we're, we're looking decent in terms of scripture. It is purely in terms of me actually getting them edited fast enough. So I hope you enjoy my monstrous month of October and it will likely go into November and December because there are a lot of requests and I am very excited to get into them. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoy this dark series, month of October and beyond. And a specific thank you to all of my Patreons, but I want to give a shout out to Crystal RVA, Ashley Millett, Eleanor Cargill, Janice, Doomed Days, Barbara Lebuta, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Arch Capitalist, Jack Manson, Chris Darden, Robbie Groves, Nicholas Reed, Alison Sato, Bill Patton, Laura Burkholz, and Andrea Bazil, or Basil, Bazil, Bazil. Thank you all for being my top tier patrons. Thank you to all of my patrons for making this possible. I really hope you enjoy part two because that's much longer and I will see you soon for part two. Be happy, be healthy, and remember, books save lives, so keep reading. <laughs>